Let me also uh, thank our, the organizers of this conference, Peter Ward and Victoria Rodriguez and Jamie Galbraith, who put together such a wonderful uh, program. Let me thank also Lovedy Grossman and the intrepid staff of the LBJ School Conferences and Training Staff, which uh, operated with incredible resilience in shifting things around to uh, accommodate the mother nature. Uh, let me extend a special welcome home to Professor Emeritus Sidney Weintraub, who we had a chance to talk with last night, and Mexico's Consul General Rosalba Ojeda. And let me extend a personal welcome to my former Princeton colleague, Doug Massey. It's good to see you down here, Doug. Uh, I still have a little affection for my former institution, so it's good to see a former colleague. This is an important conference. Um, as I tell my students, Public policy problems, despite what you may hear in the glib commentary in the blogosphere, are really hard. These are hard challenges. Issues are complex. Politics gets in the way. There are huge stakeholders involved in these enormous issues. And to have a chance of answering them, you have to start by asking the right questions. If you don't do that, you have no chance. Whatever, if you do ask the right questions, you at least have a shot at coming up with some public policy solutions to these uh, problems. I think this conference has asked some of the right questions, many of the right questions. Maybe the most important of all came up at the very end of last night's uh, dinner when uh, President Zedillo invoked President Johnson's civil rights legislation and other landmark legislation asso associated with his uh, presidency. Um, in early April, we're going to be hosting a civil rights summit here on campus together with the LPJ Presidential Library. Uh, Jimmy Carter's coming, Bill Clinton is coming, George W. Bush is coming. An invitation is pending to uh, Barack Obama. We hope he will come, but we have three former presidents committed already. One of the themes will be this very one of looking back 50 years at the issues that arose then and looking forward to where we are in 2014, how some of those same issues play out in today's context. And as Jamie Galbraith put it so eloquently last night, 50 years ago, the challenge was a large and important segment of our population, a contributing segment of the population vital to the economy and society, lacked full political rights. LBJ sought to address that uh, with his legislation. Now, 50 years later, again, a large, important segment of our population vital to our economy and society lacks full political rights. So I think this is one of the themes that will um, will filter through the, the entire proceedings today. So I look forward to this conference addressing NAFTA's finished and unfinished business, NAFTA's intended and unintended effects. And it is now my great honor and privilege to introduce the Chancellor of the University of Texas System, Dr. Francisco Cigaroa. Um, you have seen his biography in, uh, in the program, but let me just note some high points. He's a renowned pediatric and transplant surgeon, still a practicing surgeon despite his obligations as chancellor. He's a native of Laredo, the border town of Laredo, which is as emblematic as any of both the proximity and the distance between our two cultures and some of the challenges ahead. He earned his bachelor's degree from Yale, and Peter, we have now exceeded our quota of Yale graduates in this, in this program. <laughs> and received his medical degree from the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center uh, in at Dallas. During his postgraduate training, he became chief resident in general surgery at Massachusetts General in Boston and completed fellowships in pediatric surgery and transplantation surgery at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore. Dr. Sigaroa joined the faculty of the University of Texas Health Systems Center at San Antonio in 1995 where he served as director of pediatric surgery before serving as president of the institution from 2000 to 2009. In 2009, he became the first Hispanic to be named chancellor of the University of Texas System. He is a member of, among others, the American College of Surgery, the Institute of Medicine, the American Board of Surgery, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So it is my great pleasure, Francisco, to welcome you to our conference. Well, thank you very much for uh, that kind introduction, Dean Hutchings. And uh, to Victoria, always great uh, to see you. 
uh, to Peter. Uh, you know, you've been, you know, such a contribution to the University of Texas. It's always great to be with Peter and Victoria at the Joe and Teresa Lozano Long Center, listening to Pepe Romero and other, you know, music from Mexico and Spain. So, you know, they're my they're my music buddies. <laughs> And of course, uh, I don't see Rosalba here, our Consul General, but uh, you know she has also been, you know, a remarkable leader here in Austin, you know, making certain that we, you know, understand uh, the great contributions in Mexico and also, you know, the number of outstanding leaders from Mexico here in Austin. So she's been a wonderful uh, ambassador to Mexico right here. Well, I also want to welcome you all to this uh, conference. Uh, I'm kind of sorry about the weather. I, I when I woke up this morning, I looked outside. I just couldn't imagine what all this, you know, commotion was about. Uh, somebody told me that uh, this was the Texas version of the polar vortex, and, and I guess I, I call it the Polaris Vortejas. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I have no idea. I, I didn't even wear a coat this morning. Um, well, you know, my presentation today is really uh, to provide some personal perspectives. It's not like. You know, I'm an expert or a political scientist or a transportation engineer, but as Dean Hutchings stated, I did, you know, grow up uh, in Laredo, a very important land port uh, between uh, the United States and Mexico. Um, growing up in Laredo, uh, probably from the moment I took my first breath of life, uh, I experienced uh, two cultures immediately. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if the nurse who gave me that little spank at the butt, uh, said, buenos dias, uh, bienvenido. Uh, it probably, probably happened. Um, and the cigarroas, you know, before NAFTA, were practicing free trade all the time because we would go to Nuevo Laredo every day. Uh, my grandparents were living in Nuevo Laredo, Mexico. Uh, I met my wife, Graciela, in Nuevo Laredo. And so uh, there was not a day, not a weekend, that we certainly uh, did not live, you know, in Mexico. Uh, my maternal grandfather, Emeterio Flores, uh, who had a huge impact on my life, uh, was first a miner in Zacatecas, Mexico, and and then became a rancher um, through through his uh, inheritance of, of of land from his father. Uh, in a cattle ranch on the border of Tamaulipas and Nuevo León. So I'd spend a lot of my time uh, in Mexico. Um, in the summertime, I would spend uh, practically every summer in Mexico City because uh, I grew up in a family of 10. Um, my parents, or at least my mother, was wise enough that there was too much testosterone in the family in the summertime, and she'd shoo us off uh, to Mexico City to learn uh, you know, to learn Spanish, uh, to learn culture, uh, to learn really the life, the art, uh, and, and, and the sentiments of the citizens of Mexico by spending the entire summer in Mexico City. Uh, my father, Dr. Joaquin Cigarroa, was the first uh, individual in our family to be educated in the United States of America. And um, he uh, actually is an alumnus of the University of Texas in Austin, became a distinguished alumnus, uh, did not graduate from the University of Texas at Austin because in the 1940s uh, there was a great need for physicians. And so after his third year here at UT Austin, uh, he was accepted at Harvard Medical School. And um, you know he did ask, now that you're a chancellor, can you give me my degree? And I said, well, you know I can't do that, Dad, but you can take an online course and you know get those 15 credits you still need. Um, well, a little bit about growing up in, in, in Laredo. I, I grew up in a, in a, in a large family. Um, you know, my father, as I've stated, was a physician. And just a little bit about his father. Uh, so my, my paternal grandfather uh, was born in Mexico City. I got his doctorate of medicine at UNAM. And after the Mexican Revolution, I came to the United States. Kind of not an uncommon story. Um, you know, of, of individuals still living in the United States. Um, my godfather, uh, Francisco Gonzalez de la Vega, uh, was actually um, a, a professor at UNAM, a professor of law, uh, eventually became 
uh, governor of Durango, and then ultimately um, ended up, um, you know, uh, playing several several political roles in in Mexico. So, again, this was this is pre NAFTA, but but it was really from, from our family perspective, we were one. Well, growing up with dad, uh, we would make house calls all the time. Uh, that really provided me this tremendous understanding of the cultures between Nuevo Laredo, Mexico, and Laredo. And you know, many of these individuals along the border who couldn't actually afford health care uh, were actually Mexican citizens uh, in the United States uh, without citizenship. And, and Dad and, and us would have to go to their homes and, and provide health care to those citizens. Um, Dad, still at the age of 89, is still making house calls and still is seeing patients no matter uh, what their citizenship is and no matter what their socioeconomic background is. So I actually think that that experience has made me a better, better chancellor. Um, seeing my father's love for his practice, uh, I really received firsthand uh, really kind of the art of medicine. That art is not only a science. I mean, that medicine is not only a science, but it's an art and also really understood all socioeconomic uh, opportunities and challenges. Um, you know, I'm really very, very proud of also, uh, Peter, when you showed me around this room and saw just this incredible artwork, photography uh, that Danai um, Stratu made. It, it really, again, demonstrates that we ought to be building bridges more than walls. And it reflects again going back to my childhood. Well, when two cultures exchange ideas and resources and when we cross borders to learn from one another and to experience all that our neighbors have to offer, there is no doubt that our lives are enriched in, in so many immeasurable ways. Our institutions, our universities are strengthened and our people benefit in so many, so many tangible ways and intangible ways. And in the process, um, Part of the beauty, part of the magic is that we, we learn how to respect each other. We learn how to understand each other's challenges. We learn uh, that, in fact, this understanding is really the pathway towards global peace. Another reason to work together with our neighbors in Mexico is to solve challenges that are common to both our nations. Healthcare, immigration, crime, poverty, the environment, sustainable energy, national security, just to name a few. And if you take a look at just healthcare and public health, Mexico does public health better than the United States. Uh, more citizens in Mexico are probably vaccinated than citizens in the United States. Uh, when you take a look at the Hispanic paradox, uh, you know, basically on the border, uh, which is a socioeconomically very disadvantaged region, the health of infants and children are actually better uh, than their counterparts uh, because of the importance of the family unit. And, and, and it's something that I see every day as a condition. Our proximity to Mexico and Latin America and our rapidly growing Hispanic population gives Texas really a unique opportunity uh, to develop Latin American bicultural studies as part of the educational experience throughout our state. This should not intimidate us. We should embrace it. This should instead prepare Texas students for a future where knowledge and understanding of other cultures are crucial to their intellectual development and possibly even their economic mobility and stability. The total student population of our three border institutions at the University of Texas, and you just take a look at University of Texas at Paso, University of Texas Pan American, University of Texas at Brownsville, when you take a look at UT students along the border, it exceeds 52,000 students. We have a major educational presence. And to me, part of the challenges that we're facing on the border, whether it's on the US side or on the Mexico side, is the need to enhance educational opportunities uh, for those first time generation students. 40% of all students at the University of Texas academic institutions are Hispanic. Those percentages are significantly higher at our three border institutions. In fact, UT Pan Am is 90% plus Hispanic. The student population at UT Brazil is 
at UTEP, it's 80%. Now, another thing that we've been involved with, and again, it goes back to this childhood experience that I had, is uh, you know, I decided to be bold about South Texas. Uh, again, one of the most underserved regions of the state on the border. And, and when you take a look at their educational opportunities that they've had historically, uh, I wasn't very proud you know, as chancellor. And, and in fact, when I would visit with those presidents, they would say, you know, we've got University of Texas in front of our name, but we don't get any of the resources that University of Texas gets. That is, the West Texas lands, you know, which is the greatest asset of the University of Texas, that the revenues of oil and gas, develop an endowment that's in excess of $15 billion. Try to guess what? 13 universities would be beneficiaries of the distribution of that endowment. Two universities were not. And try to guess which universities were not. University of Texas Brownsville and University of Texas Pan Am with a Hispanic population of 90% plus. And they'd come to me to say, you know, you all have tennis shoes and we've got white outches. You know, how are we going to compete? And so it's amazing what happened. Uh, you know, I mean, basically, President Julieta Garcia would come to me and say, Francisco, I just for the record want to tell you, you know, I know that you're recruiting great faculty from around the world through, you know, the STARS funding, which is what the Board of Regents provide to help, let's say, UT Austin uh, recruit their great faculty. But I just want to let you know, we're not eligible for that. We, we can't play that game. So I just want to be on the record to say that. And so, you know, she would come to me and say, can't you give us some puff money? I go, you know, the Constitution doesn't allow it. We'd have to actually get a constitutional amendment uh, that would be next to impossible. Well, anyhow, it's amazing what a crisis does. So uh, two and a half years ago, a 20-year partnership between the University of Texas Brownsville and a community college fell apart. The community college trustees wanted to have their independent community college and not be a part of the University of Texas. You know, I mean, I just couldn't imagine this is happening before my eyes for a Hispanic chancellor and this unbelievable partnership falling apart. And then, uh, you know, the Board of Regents said, well, you know, don't worry, we're going to support you. We'll create a university of the 21st century and, you know, let's dream big. And, well, you know, I'm the CEO of the University of Texas system and, and I really love people to dream big. The bottom line is as the CEO, you got to link dreams to budgets. And then I would take a look at the budgets and, you know, they've got a 0.5% operating margin. And you take a look at the financials and their endowments aren't that high. I go, I don't, you know, I don't know what world you're living in. But this is not going to work unless we find a way to provide resources. And their only resources are state appropriations at a time when state appropriations for higher ed are continuing to decline. And by the way, the last time the state of Texas gave money for capital projects was 10 years ago. And you're going to bet that they're going to, I mean, we're, we're setting expectations based on a bet? I don't think so. And especially with a population that has been told so many times, we're going to help you, and then there's nothing to be said. So I actually had to create, you know, so if I didn't come up with a solution, University of Texas Brownsville was going to be a lost child. You know, one of our 15 children basically drifting. So I can't make that. I, I, we've got to figure out a way. So as usual, uh, challenges and crises are really kind of the spirit of innovation. So we had a think tank, and it's amazing. The, you know, one of my governmental affairs uh, staff, who was the previous parliamentarian for the Texas legislature for 20 years ago, said, "Well, you know, Chancellor, the solution is easy." I go, "Well, I don't know. People have been thinking about this for 75 years. You know, what's the point?" He goes, "Create a new university." I go, "Okay. Uh, <laughs> how are you going to do that, Steve?" Well, you know. You combine UT Brownsville, UT Pan America, and we already have the authority to create a school of medicine. Put it all under one umbrella. Create a new university.
go to the legislature, get two thirds support for that. If you get two thirds support for the legislature, um, you create a new university, and because it's a new university, they're eligible for permanent university funds. That's the ticket. That's, that sounds easy. So uh, basically, uh, the first meeting I had with a legislator who was from, from down there said his response was, this is stupefying. And I thought, oh my god, this is the worst idea I've ever come up with. And he says, nobody's ever thought of this. This is the answer. And before you know it, uh, within three months, we got 100% unanimous approval by, by the legislature. So now we've created a new university called the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley with a mission and the guiding principles of that is going to be bilingual, bicultural, biliterate. And we allocated the first $200 million of permanent university funds to the Rio Grande Valley just a month ago. And, you know, that is going to transform the Texas-Mexico border. And in a way, I think that was a part of the spirit of NAFTA. Um, so I'm really excited about the global impact of that. Well, the University of Texas institutions, especially UT Austin, have also had a very successful and longstanding bilateral relationship with students and with educators and with scientists and business leaders from Mexico. UT has provided students and professors with opportunities to travel to Mexico to do research, to study, and cultural interaction. In fact, I've been a beneficiary of that. Uh, you know, again, uh, visiting UDAM and UNAM and Monterrey Tech, you know, many times before. In fact, Monterrey Tech, as we're taking a look at how we take advantage of online courses and blended courses, uh, there is no one in the world doing it better than Monterrey Tech, bar none. Uh, there's a lot of roadkill of people trying to do this, but Monterrey Tech has figured it out. So we have a lot to learn from Monterrey Tech. Uh, we've reached out to students and to scholars from Mexico and other Latin American countries, um, offering fellowships, conferences, opportunities to see UT Austin collections and facilities. We have over 512 students from Mexico here at the University of Texas Austin right now. In fact, I met about 200 of those at the Texas Capitol just last week. This year, across the system, uh, there are nearly 3,000 students from Mexico, and University of Texas at Paso has 1,500 of those students. Uh, because at UTEP, uh, students from El Paso pay in-state tuition uh, because it really is an international uh, university, just like Texas A&M International in Laredo. Uh, the uh, Teresa Lozano Long uh, Latin American Studies is you know, the best Latin American program in the United States. Um, I'm happy that my daughter is a graduate of LILAS, and um, I'm very proud that her dissertation was on the Dreamers. Uh, so, you know, she's a real advocate uh, for immigration reform. And, you know, let's see what this newly minted graduate does. Uh, you know, the world is hers to, to conquer. Um, I might also add that we offer Latin American studies at seven of our nine UT academic institutions. And those programs also are very, very successful. Uh, researchers at UT Austin are involved in a number of programs and projects in collaboration uh, with partners from Mexico, uh, including oil exploration, renewable energy, optical, optical lasers, and water technology. And now under the current administration from Mexico, where you know, they're fostering more entrepreneurialism uh, in the areas of oil, of oil exploration, I think there's going to be a lot more you know, bilateral you know, commerce as it relates uh, to oil and gas. Another example is the Center for Global Innovation and, and Entrepreneurship, a research center founded by UT Austin in Nuevo León, Mexico. So in conclusion, uh, the University of Texas institutions have greatly benefited from an open exchange of people and resources with research centers and institutions of higher learning in Mexico. And, and not only our students, but I have benefited uh, from such uh, programs and also benefited in so many ways from growing up on the border. We welcome interaction, we welcome collaboration, we welcome being bilingual, bicultural, biliterate. 
Uh, this is the intellectual free trade we embrace. We will continue to look for more academic and research opportunities and more exchanges with our great country, our great neighbor, Mexico. Muchas gracias. Thank you.